Final Fantasy XVI's world, Valsthea, it feels like you could fit it in a thimble and there isn't a square inch of it worth dismounting to see. Combined with the poor side quests, the uneven pacing of the main quest, the repetitiveness of the core mission design and the over-reliance on cutscenes, Final Fantasy XVI is a real slog and as good as its combat is, it's not nearly good enough to save it. I can't believe I'm saying this, but Skill Up was right. Despite having gained the nickname Shill Up on this channel over the last couple of years, I've got to say, he gave a very fair review of this game, very critical, and I pretty much agree with about 90% of his points. I feel like there's almost no point to me reviewing this myself. You could probably just check out his review. That being said, I did think of several things he didn't quite cover or I don't quite agree with. And I'm sure most of you don't even watch Skill Up and probably are not going to bother watching his video, so... I figured I might as well still make this anyway, but if you're one of those people who dislikes every video I make and say, I'm way too critical on video games, I hate every modern game, old, good, new, bad, just know that one of the biggest reviewers on this platform agrees with pretty much everything I'm about to say here. Now on to Final Fantasy 16 itself. If you're anything like me and thought that God of War Ragnarok and many other Sony games have way too many cutscenes, way too many moments where the game takes away control from you, do not buy this game. Period. It doesn't matter how good you think the gameplay is, it is not worth full price to anyone if you're just here for the Devil May Cry-esque combat. Because you're not going to be in combat for over 75% of this game. That is worse than God of War Ragnarok, legitimately. And just like God of War, it's one of the most boring games I've ever played. Now, is the combat good? Yes, it is. But does that mean it is truly innovative, breaks new boundaries, is a unique experience, or, if you're not expecting that, does it at least improve on the Devil May Cry formula? Well, I'm not exactly the best person to give you the answer to the latter part of that question, because I still have not gotten around to playing any of the DMC games. Yes, I know, I need to play them, I will get around to it eventually, I promise. But I have played similar hack and slash games to DMC before, whether it be God of War, or Bayonetta, or Metal Gear Rising. Yeah, none of them are exactly the same, but whatever. It doesn't matter for the sake of this review. Trust me, the combat has a fatal flaw that will likely turn off even the biggest DMC enthusiasts. And so, because this game was so comically boring with so few gameplay sections and some of the worst level design I've seen, especially from an extremely high-budget game, I could not bear to finish this. So you can consider this an impressions review of the first 18 hours of gameplay. So I was roughly about halfway into the game, though some sources report this being up to 50 hours long, but I started skipping side quests, so 30 is more realistic. And trust me, there's a reason I skipped the side quests too. So this has been another unnecessarily long intro. Let's get into the gameplay. The combat is easily the best part of this game and the only reason you should even consider purchasing it. I will try to cover the most positive aspects and talk about the issues at the end. So similar to a lot of character action games, the main appeal of combat like this is to string as long a combo as possible to deal maximum damage and juggle an enemy so they can't hit you back. You know, you've probably played a game like this before. And despite the initial simplicity that the combat seems to have, especially for the first like five or six hours of the game, the more abilities you obtain, the more it opens up, and the more different attacks you can string together. And it feels pretty damn satisfying, especially specifically your iconic abilities deal massive damage and in a lot of cases can further extend your combo. Now to get into a minor issue I have with this already, I think your basic attack moveset is way too simplistic. You have a basic 4 hit slash combo. On triangle you can shoot a fireball or whatever icon you currently have equipped, you shoot their element out. You can charge a slash or a fireball, and you can also perform what's called magic burst, where you mix any number of magic attacks in between your sword swings. If you press square and X at the same time, you can do a lunge, and if you perform that same move in the air, you do a downward thrust, which does more damage based on how high in the air you are. And on circle, based on what icon you have equipped, you also have a special move unique to each one of the elements. 
Now that might sound like a decent amount of moves, but for roughly the first five hours of the game, and yes I'm including cutscenes in that number, all you have is the Phoenix icon, which means that the combat in the beginning of this game is super fucking boring after the first hour. It takes way too long for this game to give you new abilities, and even once you get Garuda, and then you have access to two more equipable abilities, and you also get Torval the dog who can knock enemies into the air. Yes, the combat starts getting pretty good at that point and more interesting, but even then, you have another four or five hours until you get this game's version of Devil Trigger, which is the limit break, which makes all your basic attack combos do significantly more damage. They can chain infinitely instead of just being stuck as a four hit combo and you regenerate health as you hit enemies. So I've got no real complaints about the limit break to be clear. I actually like that quite a bit. But even so, between that time when you get Garuda's abilities and get limit break is a long fucking stretch, dude. And another issue is the fact that you're stuck with that basic four hit combo for the entire game. There are no other weapons. The long sword is the only weapon and you just get versions with higher stats. They don't even have elements. There's no status resistances in this game. There's no status ailments as far as I can tell either. Especially not on the player side. You can't poison anybody or put them to sleep or freeze them or mind control them to attack their enemies or really anything interesting at all. You don't get any direct control over party members except for the dog. So the party members only exist to randomly throw out an attack every once in a while. It doesn't really factor into combat in any way. This doesn't feel like an RPG by any stretch. Let's be clear. All of the equipment is just based on basic stats. The only accessories that are interesting are the ones that reduce the cooldown to your abilities. And the skill tree is super basic too, not even worth covering on any level. But to get back to the combo system, even if you do end up stringing a cool combo together without abilities, your basic moves do so much less damage than abilities that it seems completely fucking pointless. And that's what I believe to be the fatal flaw of this combat system. You can do a lot of cool stuff, string a lot of cool moves together, especially once you get the dog, Torval. He can launch enemies in the air, he can attack them with you. And stringing together these combos is more difficult than it seems, so when you pull it off, it does feel a little bit rewarding, but not nearly enough because the damage just does not compare to the ability damage. And you could just spam all six of your abilities back to back, because once you have lightning, you've got six equipped abilities at that point. The stuff that actually takes skill in this game doesn't matter because basic attacks do so much less damage than abilities. And on that same line, there's no combo meter. So you're not rewarded in that way either. You're not graded after or during combat. So realistically, someone could hit square, 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 triangle the entire fucking game just using abilities when they come off cooldown, and they're doing almost as much damage as you are. Now here's the thing, you can definitely still have fun with this game without caring about the combos. Honestly, I had more fun when I was just doing whatever I knew I could do reliably, because it's just fun to hit enemies in this game. It has good sound design, it has a bunch of over-the-top particle effects everywhere, and the basic enemy types die very quickly, so that makes you feel powerful. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the bosses, which at first I felt a bit conflicted about, but the further you get into the game, the bosses get better and better, more fun, more over-the-top. None of them are particularly difficult. This certainly is no Souls game, no Ninja Gaiden. I actually only died two times over the course of 18 hours, and one of those times was because I got killed instantly in one hit by an exploding fireball guy. You can get hit about seven or eight times without dying, and you're given seven heals. And like I said earlier, limit break regenerates your health when you hit enemies. But a boss doesn't have to be challenging to be fun. This game does spectacle combat extremely well. This is one of the few times I've seen a game in recent years where both the player and the bosses can do spectacular over-the-top attacks. And dodging, which is something I haven't mentioned up until now, itself feels very satisfying. If you dodge right before an enemy hits you, you get a strong counter-attack on square or triangle. 
And you can also parry enemies, which is significantly more difficult, but if you attack the moment an enemy is about to hit you and your sword collides with their attack, you deflect the attack and time slows down, giving you a few seconds to get free hits on the enemy, which is the only way to stun bosses without depleting their stagger meter. That's an important thing, because I do have one minor issue with these boss battles, and that is their extreme super armor. While a boss's stagger meter is full, it will super armor through any of your attacks, including your strongest iconic abilities. The stagger meter is depleted by will damage. All attacks do some amount of will damage, but elemental attacks deal more than physical attacks. So you can either use your basic projectile attacks, or more likely you're going to use your icon abilities, which do a shocking amount of stagger damage, but the only problem with that is, due to their long cooldowns, you're more likely to want to save them for when you deplete the stagger meter. And so despite their varied attacks, the nature of every boss battle in this game is exactly the same. Because of their super armor, the only way to stagger them is to deplete their stagger meter to half, which opens them up for a couple seconds, and using Garuda's circle ability, you can gain another couple seconds to deal damage by pulling them to the ground, which has a unique animation for each boss, which I'll definitely give the developers credit on that one, that's pretty satisfying. And then when you deplete the stagger meter all the way, you do vastly increased damage, and the more hits you deal on an opponent, it builds up a combo multiplier, and that's where you deal the vast majority of the damage on the boss. Now for those of you who play MMOs, that is a familiar mechanic to many of you, I'm sure. That the bulk of your damage is done when the boss is in a vulnerable phase. The thing is, that's not really satisfying for action game combat, especially when there's no real gimmicks to these bosses, it's all about just learning their movesets and dodging or parrying accordingly. That being said, the bosses were certainly the highlight of this game. Even the mini-bosses were pretty good, even though a few of them repeat several times over the course of the game. It's just a shame that the bosses discourage you using long combos even more than normal enemies do, because the human-sized bosses are too small to even be hit by your air combos, and air combos are fun, they always are in these action games. And even in the case of the large ones, when you're in the actual damage phase when their stagger meter is down, the most efficient way of killing the boss is just spamming all of your high damage abilities back to back. And that's really the crux of my issue with this. Ability spam is where all of your damage comes from, as I said earlier. Yes, you're still encouraged to use normal moves to build up that damage multiplier first, and you can use Limit Break to make your standard strikes do much more damage, which of course you're going to do. But like God of War Ragnarok, it becomes more and more about spamming runic attacks. Once you have six runic attacks, in this game's case abilities, it's much more beneficial to just spam those back to back. That being said, the boss fights are fun. My complaints about them are really minor, and I'm glad that there's so many of them. So the combat remained interesting for my entire playtime, and ultimately was not my major problem with this game. Now before we move on to the next section, I want to briefly talk about the kaiju battles. This is something that is more about spectacle than it is about gameplay. The kaiju battles are fine, I think. The first two were way too simplistic and lasted too long, but when you get to the third kaiju fight, you're actually given full control of Ifrit, and he actually kind of controls like Clive, but way more simplistic. And that battle, the third battle, was actually pretty damn fun. I don't have any complaints. Yes, it was easy, but it's supposed to be like a glorified gameplay cutscene hybrid. And I'd say it serves that purpose perfectly. It's supposed to weave together gameplay and narrative. And it was one of the few times in this game that I think it was done effectively. So if you think this stuff is really cool, I'm not going to take that away from you. For me, the actual cutscenes and the quick time event stuff were very reminiscent of Asura's Wrath, and I actually kind of liked that game. But the difference between that game and this game is that Asura's Wrath is only like six hours long, so cool shit was happening like all the time, and it was structured like a season of TV. 
So the pacing really worked for that game. I know people have a lot of problems with that. I feel like if it came out today, people would actually love it because people have been conditioned to watch hours of cutscenes. So the kaiju battles were fun and interesting. They definitely had some DBZ moments. And like I said, Astro's Wrath. So if you like the over-the-top anime shit, you'll probably like these. Okay, so now moving on to the story. This is why you shouldn't buy this game. Period. I would say, just judging by the fact that 75% of this game, possibly more, is cutscenes and dialogue of a story that's not even good, by the way. I got spoiled of the ending, and I mean like all the details of the ending, before release. And the ending alone will leave a dog shit taste in your mouth, dude. Trust me. The ending is horrible. And you might say to yourself, well, maybe the characters are good. No, the characters aren't good either. Clive is the only real character, and he's not even a good one. Clive feels like a relic of the mid to late 2000s, where they had these edgy protagonists like Alex Mercer or Shadow the Hedgehog, or whatever the guy's name from Dark Sector is. That type of character that is just this emo edgelord type. And Clive's even worse than them because he cries and screams in multiple scenes. In fact, the Giga Chad looking bad guy autistically screams out of nowhere in a random scene. It was very awkward. He said sit, paid him. Why is there more screaming? <laughs> and some of you might be thinking, how could the story possibly be bad? The story in the demo was good, and I'm with you. I actually did think the story in the demo was good. There were too many cutscenes still, even in the demo. But it's very evident that the game director was inspired by Game of Thrones. That's another thing he's admitted to directly. Because the beginning of the story with the political intrigue and the family drama was actually quite good. After the time skip that takes place directly after the demo, which is 13 years by the way, Clive gives his live reenactment of 12 years a slave, as the slave, and we don't get to see any of that. That could have been a great character development moment. We could have seen why he's such an emo in the future, because we already got to see some of his life issues in the beginning of the game, with his mother being crowned bitch of the year, viewing her own son as trash, a genetic defect that should have been aborted, a failure because he wasn't the dominant. That's a terrible name, by the way, but the dominants are essentially the people who have the icons inside of them. They're like gods among men, yet apparently they can be enslaved. A lot of them are subservient to empires, but if you can turn into a fucking kaiju, why would you listen to anyone? A fucking Jill, who is Clive's childhood friend, somehow gets enslaved despite the fact that she can activate her icon ability at will, unlike Clive. And that's a whole other thing too. Like in the very intro of the game, and don't worry, I'm not gonna spoil anything that happens after like the three hour mark. It's very evident to the audience that Clive is a freak. The way it's framed, it doesn't even seem like they're setting up a twist. But for the sake of the story, Clive doesn't know. He assumes some other dominant of fire that we've never seen before killed his brother in cold blood. And then the game actually acts like this is a big reveal after you fight Garuda and Sid sees you transform into Ifrit. It's not a twist, everyone knew. They didn't even pretend it was a twist. And this isn't even the first time the story does this either. I'm not gonna spoil the other thing, though you could probably guess it relates to Joshua. He's obviously an important character, and his icon is the Phoenix. You know what Phoenixes do. I don't even have to spoil it, you could just logic your way into that twist. I think most people did. And after the 13 year time skip, the story just drops off a fucking cliff. On top of what I said earlier about that possibly being a great opportunity to develop Clive's character and we really get to know him as a person, the plot just stops being interesting after that point. Your bitch mother disappears from the story. At the time of me recording this, I haven't even seen her again. And there's a second time skip. Maybe you could consider that a spoiler. I don't. 
So Clive hasn't even seen his own mother in 18 years, and I thought they were setting her up to be like one of the main villains, but she's barely in the story for the first half. Now another problem I want to bring up with the story is the tonal whiplash and also just the conflict of themes in general, and this seems to be a problem with a lot of Japanese media. Japan really struggles with telling a serious dark story, and I think this story is a perfect example of that, where it wants to be Game of Thrones, DBZ, and Kingdom Hearts all at the same time. Well, let me tell you, you cannot mix a serious, grounded, dark fantasy story with Kingdom Hearts. It doesn't fucking work. You cannot have a bunch of people's throats getting slit, having an almost rape scene, and then in the next scene you have a guy autistically screeching for no apparent reason, and then adult Joshua coming in looking like Roxas from Kingdom Hearts 2, talking about saving his brother, anime style, and, and then Clive screaming and crying because a certain someone dies, and it's just, oh boy, it's fucking cringe, man. I mean, slavery of all things is a major theme in this game, and there's a cartoonish racism scene in this bar where a woman casually talks about giving away her newborn baby because it's one of these bearers, the people with magic powers. And that's another plot hole with the plot in general, is that the race, quote unquote, that everyone is racist against, the bearers, are people with magic powers. So you're telling me, if in medieval times, random people were born with a firearm built into their arm that somehow they would be enslaved? No, they would kill all the normal people and enslave what was left of them. It makes no sense the other way around. Even worse, with what I told you about the dominance. That some of the dominance serve these people. They could wipe out an entire fucking army by themselves. And they never explain this, by the way. Maybe it's in the shitty lore that I'm not gonna read. Because fuck lore, lore is a terrible band-aid for modern games. Nerds are obsessed with trivial shit that does not matter. You know what matters? The narrative and the characters, and this game fails on both accounts. And the characters are constantly brooding and depressed. There's a scene where it looks like a bunch of bodies got burnt. There's another scene where there's a bunch of corpses that are strung up. And then not an hour later, you do a goofy play reenactment with your uncle. And Dude, I know there's people who like this shit, but it's mega ultra cringe to me. I actually really like grim, dark, ultra edgy shit, and I also like goofy, lighthearted shit, but there comes a point where you can't mix the two together. It's not like Final Fantasy hasn't done dark themes or had a dark story concept in general before. As I've said before, the only one I finished was 10. And 10, yeah, it has some major story and character issues, but I still really like the story as a whole. And the villain, Maester Seymour, is honestly ahead of his time because he's the perfect nihilist. He wants to wipe out humanity because he wants to end suffering, thinks life is pointless because it's an endless cycle. Sin can only be sated for a certain amount of time when a priestess is sacrificed. So yeah, that story actually had a really dark premise, but it had many moments of levity, some light-hearted characters that were enjoyable to watch, except for Tidus, fuck him. And Yuna's kind of boring, but like, all the other side party members were interesting. This game has nothing like that. If you don't like Clive, you're not gonna like the characters. And I'm serious, when nothing interesting happens, it feels like half of the main quests are filler. You go to a place, you kill some minor enemies, maybe you fight a fun mini-boss, then the mission's over. And when it comes to the level design, there's actually nothing to even talk about, because you either have these linear levels that are hallways, fucking final hallway 16, or there's a couple open zones in the game, and guess what? There's nothing in them. All that open space just to pick up a couple crafting materials or maybe fight a unique mini-boss. That's all that's in there, guys. It's a bunch of empty space. You know, just like an MMO. Hmm, maybe it was a bad idea to get MMO developers to develop a single player game. And I gotta say it one last time before we get to the conclusion. There's too many fucking cutscenes. Some of these cutscenes did not need to exist, like walking on an elevator or walking off an elevator or the characters talk about something they've already talked about three goddamn times. 
There are many cutscenes in this game over 10 minutes, dude. I split my recordings into hour-long segments, right, for editing purposes. Two of my recordings are 90% cutscenes, and the battles that made up the other 10% were nothing. 50 straight minutes of talking to NBCs about nothing that actually fucking matters. I have no idea how the hell gamers make an excuse for this shit. Okay, let's just get to the conclusion before I keep complaining about the same things over and over again. Is the combat good? Yes. Maybe I didn't sell it that well because as you know, I do focus on the negatives a lot of times, but I do think it's a fun combat system. There's a decently high skill ceiling if you like stringing together various moves. Me personally, I stopped caring after a certain point, so you know, if the gameplay is not good enough for you, just know that it doesn't fucking matter because your damage is maybe 5% higher than mine. So, effectively your combos are pointless. Not to mention, to state it again, there is no combo meter. That being said, it is fun. I'm not gonna pretend it's not fun. I had a good time when I was in the combat. That's not my real problem with this game. The problem with this game is everything that isn't the combat. The level design is non-existent. It's all fucking hallways. The open areas are almost completely pointless. You might as well be walking in a straight line the whole fucking game. As for the story, the story's boring. All the interesting stuff happens in the first two hours. If you played the demo, you saw the best part of the story. After that, the story takes a nosedive. Nothing really all that interesting happens, except for giant boss battles turning into a kaiju, that sort of thing. And that's more just because of the spectacle value. The actual storytelling around it, what builds up to those scenes, the characters, none of that is memorable in any way, despite the fact that so much of this game is cutscenes, and it's wasted on forgettable, boring shit. This game does not respect your time. I feel like I could just copy and paste a lot of my same criticisms with God of War Ragnarok to this. So instead of playing this game, you really should just play anything else that does what this game does, but better. If you're looking for an RPG experience, this isn't even a fucking RPG, so I would suggest you play any Final Fantasy before 13 would be better than this for sure. Even something very cliche like Dragon Quest has its own charm to it. Those games are decently fun. Xenogears is a game that has a great story, but, well, that game has its own major flaw to it, but if you want a unique sci-fi setting, Xenogears definitely fits the bill. If you want a more recent game, you could just play those Xenoblade games. I'll admit I got bored 30 hours into the first one, but I gotta say I did like the story of what I played. In terms of gameplay, just play a better hack and slash game. Even God of War, which has a more simplistic and more repetitive combat than this game, at least the vast majority of the game is combat. Of course, people would probably tell you to play Devil May Cry. I can definitely vouch for Bayonetta or Metal Gear Rising, really. Metal Gear Rising is probably the best game that Platinum's ever made. Either that or Vanquish, but that's a third-person shooter, not a hack and slash, but that's still a great game, too. I would also say Dragon's Dogma, which I feel like I have to recommend every time we talk about an action RPG or hack and slash. Though Dragon's Dogma is also a severely flawed game, but unlike this game, again, the vast majority of it is gameplay, even if it's not always fun. I'd say pretty much any game that is a game, mostly a game, would be better than this game. If you cut out 50% of the cutscenes in this game, and the story was exactly the same, which it would be, because half the cutscenes are fucking filler, then I feel like I could probably recommend this at a discount. But as it stands, the only people who are going to have fun with this game are either people with incredibly low standards for storytelling, which, let's be honest, that's a lot of gamers. Gamers have no respect for their own time which is why movie games keep getting made. Can you imagine if every book had a filler chapter every 30 pages about a stupid fucking side quest where a guy has to pick up dirt? Only in gaming do we make excuses for this. I kid you not, at one point I had just felled a mighty icon in what was one of the most mind-blowing boss showdowns I've ever seen in my life. And then immediately after that, like literally five minutes after that, I was being tasked by the town engineer to go and collect lumps of dirt. So I was walking by this riverbed collecting dirt after just having vanquished a god. But yeah, to wrap this up, if Final Fantasy 16 was half gameplay, half cutscenes, it would be a fine game. As it stands, it's practically unplayable 
to anyone with a low attention span, which I'm not ashamed to say I definitely have a low attention span, but the story's not even good. Anyway, the gameplay is the only redeeming part of this game, and it is good combat. It is. And this isn't really related to the quality of the game, but it looks like Final Fantasy isn't nearly as popular as it used to be. The early sales numbers are looking pretty bad. So this might actually end up being the true Final Fantasy. See you next time, guys.